Thank you so much for coming. I'm really excited for this panel. I think it's going to be awesome. Um, so I just wanted to uh, introduce myself. My name is Liz Arredondo. I'm a visiting scholar at Media X and the robot personality designer at a company called Catalia Health, where we make a robotic wellness coach named Mebu. And um, a little bit about the structure of today. First, we will give the panelists some time to introduce themselves and their work. And then we will move into the panel discussion. And then at the end, we'll have time for audience questions and um, end a little bit early so that we can have people come up and talk if you want to do that. So um, without further ado, Brian, do you want to take it away? OK. All right. <laughs> All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Can you can you do me a favor? Uh, I, I truly believe in discourse, which means a two way exchange. So if I ask you a question, I'm actually going to I want you to answer that particular question. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to start with a, a simple argument. You can choose to disagree with it, but I'm going to argue that the things that we talk most about are the things that we know most about. Uh, there's a reason why you don't remember phone numbers. There was a day when you remembered everyone's phone number. I could say, hey, what's Liz's phone number? And you could say, 510-825-6840, right? Um, however, those days are long gone. The question is, why? I told you I was going to ask you questions. I do want an answer quickly because I have like five minutes. Because of iPhones. So the question is, what, is, what did the iPhone do to our memory? Uh, and I don't want you to answer that question. Here's the, here's the thing. Is there something beautiful about the computers on our shoulders? They only use pertinent information. So the, the issue is, the things that are most valuable to the learner are the things the learner retains most. That's the problem with teaching. Most of what we teach is fundamentally irrelevant. So relevance is everything, right? So let's talk about it. So I titled this very, very, very brief talk, Hashtags and Hearts, How Technology Can Impact Learning for Diverse Populations. A couple quick assumptions. The first is this. Science concepts are abstract and they're invisible. So part of the invisibility of an atom is that it is a model. No one has actually seen how an electron works until the instruments can give us that, develop, that, that technology. But here's the beauty. Technology can approximate these things. Technology can give us a vision of things that are abstract. Uh, the second is familiarity breeds neglect. And here's what I mean by that. I walk by science every day. When you go to the grocery store, here is a question. Why do they spray the vegetables at the grocery store? So they look fresh. So they're fresh. I answer that que question differently. I say osmosis. That's why. Because they believe in osmosis, right? The idea that water travels across semi-permeable membranes into an equal ratio or a proportion of waters on the equal side of that membrane. Here's the question. Is that because familiarity breeds neglect, I never see the science in my neighborhood. So here's my argument. Technology can help us see the science in our neighborhood. Uh, <clears throat> couple, excuse me. So I'm going to make a, a, a simple argument today, and I think technology in general, I'll talk about AI specifically, has the potential to do three things. And the first thing is micro. Is there something powerful being about taking a person inside of a phenomena to say, here, I want to take you inside of this thing. So whether or not uh, my, my phone has AI and it can tell me as I struggle to understand atoms that it's time for me to engage in the simulation, is being in the phenomena and being able to hear and see the narrative of the phenomena is a powerful way to understand there is the power of micro. The meso, it is difficult for me to get to the, to the Sahara Desert right now. Technology provides us the capacity to go from place to place quickly. So whether that be through virtual reality, whether it be through any contemporary technology, or uh, whether it be augmented reality, is the technology available to us enables to shift from location to, to location almost instantly. For an educator, that's invaluable. Uh, it, it provides me a way to give students pragmatic uh, applications of specific ideas. So have you ever heard teachers talk about protein synthesis? You're in a class, it's the most abstract thing, and they're trying to help you understand, well, where, where do I need protein th synthesis? Where does protein synthesis be, make sense? And I'm a little more pragmatic than most teachers. I want to take them to the gym and see all the bodybuilders, right, drinking protein shakes, working their muscles to understand the concept of protein synthesis by taking them across locations as a meso uh, context. And the third is a macro context. And this idea is that we can get to scale quickly. If, if, if they put uh, appropriate cameras on that Tesla car, I don't know what's on the car right now, right? But I would love for it to be streaming images right now. 
that gives us a macro scale understanding of the phenomena. So the question is, what does this have to do with culture? Is micro, meso, and macro are one thing. The other thing is representation equals authenticity. It is difficult for you to tell me that I cannot be a computer scientist if everyone in the room is a computer scientist and they look like me. Right? I can't wait for Black Panther. I believe a, a revolution in conception is going to happen next week. And here's what I mean. When students of color see themselves as engineers and, and uh, leading experts in, in contemporary technology, it is going to be hard for them to imagine themselves not in engineering and technology. So the question is, what do you do in the technology that you create to address the issue of representation? So here's the power. 71%, the, the argument that 71 to 81% of the teaching force are white and female is used as a crutch. People make the argument that that population is often unable to reach the kids who they teach because they often don't reflect those communities and contexts. Well, the question is, how does technology play a role as a cultural bridge? Here's the thing. What is the voice of the, of the technology that's interacting with the kids? What are the phenotypical images? And so we've recently completed studies where we've given students digital textbooks, and we did identity matching. We made sure that if you wore a hijab, the person teaching you wore a hijab. If you spoke with an accent, the image teaching you spoke with an accent. So the idea is that there's phenotypical cues embedded in the technology, and that can enhance students' experiences. The next is discursive cues. I think this is most important for augmented reality. Right? I am not yelling at you. I'm speaking in my academic voice. I have another voice that I use in other places. Right? <laughs> the way that I choose to communicate matches the context. So here's the question. How do we make augmented reality send students and young people messages of belonging? So imagine if I speak with an accent and my device speaks with an accent that matches mine. Or if the device is teaching me something specific and knows to communicate in a way that matches my cultural context. There's power in the representation and the discourse cues of contemporary technology, auditory cues. Again, and I'm, I'm separating discourse. For discourse is an exchange where two people are talking to each other. Auditory is just sounds. So what do the sounds cue to people? So anytime I watch a video in school when I was a student, it was horrific. Right? As a person who loves hip hop music, never heard hip hop music in the background of the, of the, the videos that I was working with. Right? So what we do is to say, I, whatever the kids are listening to, I want them to hear that as a part of the science instruction. So we may be talking about atoms, but behind the, the representations of atoms is music that sparks a connection to these kids. Right? So th the subtext here is that auditory cues are embedded. And I want to make sure that we, we leave with a fundamental understanding of learning concepts. I think one of the primary challenges in how we use technology for learning that is limited is a poor understanding of the learning principles that we as educational researchers have worked so hard to unpack over the years. And one of those things is situated cognition. And by definition, it's the idea that learning occurs in situations that produce the necessity for meaningful learning. So here's the idea. If I need to know it, right, I acquire this skill and I acquire it efficiently. So here's the best way to remember it. If you know of carpenters, carpenters are incredible at measurement. And there's a reason why. Because building the chair, making the room, Building the table requires them to be excellent at measurement. So they don't have to go to measurement school. Being a carpenter produces the necessity for understanding. So similarly, our technology must put students in situations that drive them to come to an understanding. So I'm going to close with this and show you a couple things so you get a sense of what we're doing in our lab to try to begin this kind of work. But the idea is that technology, in my eyes, has a profound potential to provide teachers a means to do cultural bridging. Uh, as teachers are in classrooms trying to reach children, as parents are at home trying to teach their own children, we want to provide them resources that, number one, provide opportunities for situated learning, create opportunities for authentic and meaningful learning. And number two, are malleable, provide kids an opportunity to see themselves in the instruction. Education is dynamic. It's not just about what happens cognitively, but also social psychologically, meaning if you send messages of belonging, kids are more likely to retain information. So I'm going to close with two quick snapshots of some of the, the kind of work that we're talking about. So, so I want to show you a, a sample of a VR lesson that we, we've produced and we're on our second round of a, a experimental work on that takes kids into a virtual lab. Um, and I want you to just pay attention to the aesthetic. Now what they're asked to do is identify producers, consumers, or decomposers, which of these things are actually happening here. Uh, 
flower, the sunflower is blowing for time lapse. Image of a whale eating. So part of what uh, you experience emotively is uh, the sound of the community, uh, which our goal is it, it should enhance their particular sense of belonging to the particular academic context. Now, from a more dynamic thing, uh, two points here. First, I didn't realize the audio was this loud. It is very loud, so you have to bear with me. Um, let's leave it loud. That's what I want. I want the room to shake, right? I'm going to take you into a grocery store. So here's a lesson about food chains and how food chains matter. The formative assessment is we take the kids to the community and we ask them to identify the numbers of fast food restaurants in their local community. We also ask them to identify the number of di diabetes, diabetes and dialysis treatment centers in their community to draw a connection between the content and the actual implications of the big idea. Mm -hmm. It goes back to the phone call principle. If I teach them something valuable that matters in their context, they're very, like, they're very likely to retain the information because as they go through the, the neighborhood with grandma and uncles and, and friends, it's likely that they'll point out that, uh, that this is what I've learned about these things. So I'll give you a quick snapshot of the kind of uh, experience we're providing for our students. Given the, the time, I'll, I'll, I'll close with that. And these things are available for a preview on, my, on our website, Science in the City, scienceinthecity.sanford.edu. So thank you for your time. I look forward to the discussion. OK. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm James Montantes. I'm from Fujitsu Laboratories of America. And uh, today I'll talk a little bit about RoboPin. And uh, so I'll try to keep kind of the corporate shilling down to a minimum. But I think the, the, some of the slides I'll share with you will kind of help set up the conversation we'll have today and just give kind of a brief history of uh, the robotics that goes on at Fujitsu Laboratories in our laboratory. So as you can see, kind of the history of, the, of robotics, first starting out in the, in the 1980s, at least for our laboratories, you have like these fully automated, or factory automated robots that do like uh, these very discreet uh, instruction sets to assemble, you know, cars or whatever. And we have other robots that maybe like this uh, advanced robot for the nuclear power plant maintenance that can go into hazardous areas, fully controlled by people. There's no AI. There's no really you know, sophisticated type of, um, other than the actual hardware itself. I mean, everything was controlled by humans. And then you have like robots that you know, can do the similar stuff in space. And then kind of uh, in the 90s and in the early 2000s, we kind of started going to more towards like a human facing or kind of a human centric type of uh, robotics. And you see these very strange uh, like this Muron 1, this autonomous movement, map matching and remote control, these kind of very cartoony looking robots, uh, food, robots for carrying food. And then uh, we also have this one, the Kuma, the bear, which is uh, more of a recent one. I've actually, we, I've used this actually in the lab. And this is, it has like a, you know, a camera, microphones, and all these things. And it's kind of for like a, like a sympathy type robot. Maybe if there's like a a sick child in a hospital or something can kind of interact with it a little bit better, or maybe like a senior citizen ha I mean, has a dementia or something, kind of create more of a like a human or human-like interface. And we also, in continuing on the uh, industrial side, we still do like, for example, these drones that do like uh, uh, inspecting infrastructure on bridges that uses a like, 3D SLAM, which is like the localization and mapping. And then, so that's kind of like goes into one of our current sort of robotics programs we have, which is RoboPin, which is this little guy here. And this is kind of like the RoboPin actually itself is an actual platform. And you know, you, you want to be able to stack any types of AIs or things on top of that. And this is kind of the more the human facing, and you can put, you think of it as like an interaction. You can speak to it, it can speak back, it can rec maybe recognize who you are. And I'll show like a, a short video to kind of explain kind of where we want to take this um, this robot as far as like use cases in the future. And you'll see one which is basically like a tourist information desk in in Japan. And also, and maybe I'll mention like also maybe uh, for like a uh, automated and automated parking. So there's like a system that can like help park your car. Anyway, that's enough about that. The history. Uh, this is the actual RoboPin. This is what it looks like here. It can do all these kinds of movements. It has lights. 
Uh, and it actually has this emotion space which we've created. And it went to the next slide. Anyway, <laughs> so let's just watch it. This will actually explain a little bit better than me uh, saying anything. OK, so imagine like a tourist information office in, in Tokyo. And there's our maybe what RoboPen will look like. <laughs> speaks to the person in Japanese. Oh, I don't understand Japanese. And the robot can kind of recognize that. And then we display like a um, interface to choose which language. It's still kind of interacting, maybe like she points to something on the map and then the RoboPin can see it. And, okay, what is this? What is it? What are her interests? And, uh, sorry if the subtitles are a little funny. also have you know an operator behind it or you know fully autonomous it's think of it as a platform you can kind of we provide the robotics and we have like the computational resources and some AIs but we want to be able to open it and you know use multiple uh, like natural language processing engines or any types of AI. these technologies are, are currently in development, like the, the scanning, the, the interface where you can kind of like point on the desk and it's like, a, you know, the light field. Okay, so that's a short video. So, and this is the actual actual prototype which we have in Sunnyvale. Um, I've actually brought it here a couple of times, and it's really interesting to get kind of feedback and just to show to people and see how people interact with it. And basically, it's like what you see here. It's got like all these sensors, you know, the camera, which kind of looks like a, an eyeball, and we, this, you can see it doesn't really have a gender or any like specific type features like that. You can put any type of voice on it. It can be a man's voice, a woman's voice. So we kind of left it kind of agnostic in, in that kind of sense. And I um, think it can be kind of appealing to maybe any person of any culture can maybe approach this. And what was kind of fascinating about the last time showing it was seeing actually how pe different uh, cultures interacted with it. We had a group, uh, they believe they're from Hong Kong, and one of the other groups from Brazil. And the way they interacted with the robot was like completely different. And their expectations of like, what a robot should do and what the robot wants, or what they want out of a robot. So anyway, yeah, I think um, that's basically it for RoboPin. And, uh, I look forward to this discussion. And I'll leave it to the next person. So I'm new to the Bay Area. My name is Jasmine Lawrence. I'm a technical program manager there at SoftBank Robotics America. We have two other offices, SoftBank Robotic Europe, which is primarily in Paris, and then SoftBank Robotics Asia, uh, which is in Tokyo, Japan. Uh, and so I was just going to tell you a little bit about myself so you could understand my perspective in coming into the conversation, a little bit of my journey through technology and how I ended up here making social humanoids. Sound good? Sounds good. Awesome. Yeah, I also <laughs> want a discourse. <laughs> okay, so uh, when I was eight years old, I saw a movie called Bicentennial Man. Has anybody ever heard of it? Okay, 1998 film with Robin Williams. He plays a humanoid robot that joins a family, and he joins them as kind of like a household worker. Uh, when I was eight years old, 
I was really into math and science, surprisingly. Uh, my parents were in the military, so basically we had to do what we were told, and one of those things was math and science. Sorry, my, I was losing my voice. But um, yeah, when I saw that movie, and when I, when I thought about my life and going to school and learning about math and science, all you hear about is like Isaac Newton and Albert Einstein and like all these cool guys who have stuff named after them. And when I was eight years old, I was like, how can I get a thing named after me? Like, how can I do a cool thing so like we measure things in like seven jasmines, like whatever. Um, and so the other side of it was when you go to school, there are these very predefined things that you can be or do, right? Um, Brian mentioned that before. Like, I could be a mom or a doctor or a scientist or, you know what I mean? Like, you can be these certain things. And I wanted a job where no one could tell me what I could do or what the bounds were. And when I saw this movie, I thought, that's it. I'm going to make that robot guy. Totally just going to devote my life to building this new thing. Um, when I was young, I was like, you know, typing on a computer and saving my papers on floppy drives. You know what I mean? Like, it was so early and that stuff seemed so far out, so future that I felt like I could be a part of inventing it and discovering it and not just using theorems and algorithms that other people had figured out forever ago. Uh, I really did feel like in 2000 that everything was figured out and everything was discovered. So science and technology was really a gateway for me. Um, I ended up getting my bachelor's degree in computer science at Georgia Tech, where I did a lot of research with social robots, so robots that are meant to help us learn about ourselves, to communicate naturally, so tons of AI in that sense, natural language processing, all these different things. Um, but you know, it was a bunch, of, a bunch of buzzwords when I got there. You know, uh, When I got there, my professor, uh, Andrea Tomas, was like, hey, we have this robot, and we need you to give it the ability to have favorite colors. And that was my first project, just right out of school. You know? And I thought, OK, how do we understand colors? What does vision mean for a device? What does favorite mean? How do I help the robot make decisions about these values that it's getting from its camera? And that really helped me understand, OK, there are two things I need to know if I'm going to make robots. I have to understand the world, and I have to understand the people that actually have to inter interact with this device. So the, the more and more that I you know, took all these classes of machine learning and robots and perception, the more I took these technical courses, uh, the less it really helped me understand how to make real products. Uh, and so I joined Microsoft, and I joined on, a, on the engineering team of the Xbox One. And I know you're thinking, like, what does a video game console have to do with robots? Uh, a lot, actually, because this is device, a device where people spend millions of hours in front of it, connecting with their friends, solving puzzles, you know, getting clues about, oh, press A to jump or press B to go back. You know, there are all these tips and social cues and you know, things that are communicated, and these games are played all around the world. So there's so many different types of games and types of challenges when you're building um, a device like that that really taught me a lot about just the large scale of commercial hardware development. Um, and so while I was working at Xbox, I went to the University of Washington to get a master's degree in human-centered design and engineering. And so when I was explaining to my parents what this degree was for, I told them that it's a degree in making things for people by asking them what they want and then building that. Because believe it or not, that's not how a lot of things are made today. Someone will invent some cool technology, or they'll just want to build a thing, and they'll sell it to you for whatever it works, uh, whatever they think it's worth. Um, but in this degree, I learned you know, more about psychology, as Brian was mentioning, learning about how people think and why people think, and the types of uh, power structures that influence the challenges that certain people have in different um, domains and, and different countries and things like that. And so, a lot of it is you know, being user-centered, being people first, understanding what is your issue, what is your problem. Uh, one of the examples they gave us on day one was you know, there's some African country and a bunch of people went over there to go help them uh, with their water. And so they're like, oh, you, just, you need more water. OK, we get it. We'll build you a bunch of wells. So they went there, they built them a bunch of wells, and then they left. And you know, they never used the wells, and they started throwing things into them. And, like, and they come back a couple years later, and they're like, oh, your village should be so prosperous and healthy. You have all this access to water and all these wells. Um, but they didn't actually test the waters. So they really didn't need more water or more wells. They actually needed filters for the water they already had. And so if they had actually asked the people, what's wrong with your water? Why don't you have enough water? They would have been able to solve the problem. So 
I left Microsoft, moved down here to Southern California because I was finally ready to do the thing that I wanted to do since I was eight years old. So after 20 years of learning how to build hardware and how to learn about people and commercialize products, I joined SoftBank Robotics where we make a humanoid robot called Now and another humanoid robot called Pepper. Uh, and these robots serve to enhance your human experience. There are a lot of things that we wish we could do, that we wish we didn't have to do, that we don't have enough time to do, or people just don't want to go and do. Um, and, and Pepper's there to, to, to fill those gaps. Um, in Japan, there are thousands of peppers. Uh, the Japanese culture is so embracing of technology and of robotics in, in particular. It's just ingrained in you know, a lot of their, their media and things like that. But in America, we have a huge stigma against um, robots in terms of them encroaching on our labor and lots of things like that. So when we started introducing Pepper into the United States, we started working with uh, corporate organizations and businesses so we can show them that robots can bring value to their day-to-day -day life. So you might see Pepper in the lobby of, you know, uh, office building that you go into in downtown San Francisco, greeting you, welcoming you, checking you in. You might see Pepper at the Oakland airport asking you how your flight was or if you got your bags on time and everything was in order. Um, so Pepper is there just working with businesses, joining your everyday life, and maybe one day I'll be able to build Andrew and you'll have Pepper in your home, I don't know, playing with your kids or washing your dishes. Who knows? But that's me. That's my spiel. Thanks for listening. Um, so just to start things off a little bit, Brian, how do you think... AI, robotic technology, other kinds of technology and conversation affect how kids learn in the classroom? Uh, so I only speak about the things that I know about. Of course. So I'm gonna yes, there. I appreciate that. So as a, as a science educator, uh, we value the power of a question in that a question is just a it's, it's an answer in reverse, right? So the way to, to make sure that people learn is to get them to answer questions. Uh, and and the, the way to help you all think about that is I'm sure at some point in your life you took a class and then you took the test. And at the moment you took the test, there was a revelation. And here's the revelation. Oh, I thought I knew it. I don't know it. <laughs> right? So if only that question would have been asked earlier and you had an opportunity to talk through it. And so here, here's the point is I think the, the real value, uh, as I see it, a real impactful uh, forward place for AI is the capacity for AI to do formative assessment to ask young people questions when the young people offer an answer. Instead of giving them right or wrong, that binary is a problem. But how about pointing out the right and the wrong answer? So that's, that's beautiful. What you said was this, and then offering uh, a better opportunity and then iterative opportunities to move forward. So one of the potentials, I think, is that AI can do what teachers really struggle to do, which is to provide one-to-one -one formative assessment and powerful questions so that students can learn. And can you see this formative assessment being different across genders, races, cultures? And how should we think about that? So I think learning is an inherently human endeavor. It, it, there is no differentiation. But I think what is powerful is offering examples that meet the needs of the students. And that part, it requires t teachers years. To, let me give you an example. I learned a few years ago that uh, when you curl your hair, you're creating uh, polar bonding, so it's positive and negative. And so it's essentially almost like a, a double helix structure. And so the reason why, for those of you whose hair is not curly, it rains, and the, the rain is polar, it'll break the bonds, right? Some, for somebody, that's, that's, that's a revelation, right? They're like, yes, absolutely, it totally makes sense, right? That example meets the needs of a particular person, and the teacher has to figure that out. AI could download that information instantaneously and know what example really meets the needs of these, these mm -hmm. people. And so in that way, the learning is, is human. The context of the learning are definitely have gender applications, racial and cultural applications that is difficult for anybody to learn. AI could be incredible. So there's a partnership to be had there. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so James, how do you think about the relationship between RoboPin and people? How do I think? Uh, yeah. How do you guys act in, in the lab? So in the lab, uh, we, of course, we try to think of you know, use cases for the robot. But I think kind of putting it in front of people is the best way to get kind of uh, a gauge of, you know, what, do they, what are they expecting of this particular robot? Or how, just how do they react to it? And you can kind of like build from there. And, you know, just, just kind of like observing and Observe, making these observations and um, being able to uh, improve on that, I think, kind of helps us and gives us valuable feedback and 
like I said, to put it in front of different groups, maybe of different cultures and, and children, how do they react to it? It could be totally different. So I, I think like what's going to be interesting is um, children growing up today are going to have totally different under, uh, expectations of robotics, and they're going to they're going to basically be growing growing up with Amazon Alexa and these really sophisticated um, technologies, which, you know, when I, growing up, I was growing up, this was just science fiction, this was just, you know, cartoons. But they're going to be growing up with it and developing new, uh, new applications and new uh, platforms that be just way beyond even what I can conceive. And when you are thinking about the relationship between RoboPin and people um, and, and putting it in front of different groups to test, how does human identity come into that? For example, gender or race identity, cultural identity, or does it? Uh, yes, it does. Uh, originally, is uh, of course developed in Japan, and so of course it speaks Japanese and it speaks in a very friendly tone and like a very high pitch, uh, like feminine voice. Mm -hmm. But as you can see with the robot pin, it doesn't have a gender. It doesn't even look human. It's right. it's. Because sometimes maybe if you have a robot that looks too much like a human, it looks kind of weird, looks kind of creepy, it's got these weird eyes. But this thing is it's just like this ball with this single eye and it's kind of cute and waves around. So in a, yes, in a sense, you want to have a cultural connection through language and through uh, its physical movements. But human, yeah, but they still can tell it's a robot. It's not human, but they can still interact with it human-like, if that makes sense. Yeah. So Jasmine, how about for Pepper and Now? When, you, when you're uh, talking about these things that work or, or with your development team, testing, are, yeah. do issues of identity come, come up at all? And, and how do you talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. So two of the key, I would say, exercises that we go through when we're developing different, I, I don't know what you want to call them. They're not features. They're more like skills or behaviors or capabilities. So I wish I had shown them a picture of what Pepper looks like so that you could have the same mental image. Pepper is super cute. As I do. Incredibly adorable. Um, but with Pepper, when we're creating different interactions, so for example, we were recently at CES, and Pepper was standing at the front of our suite greeting people. And just for that one interaction, we knew that there were going to be tons of people coming in, but we knew they were going to be coming in usually one or two at a time at regular intervals, so Pepper wouldn't be overwhelmed. The first thing we did was we role played it. We stood in front of a doorway. We thought, how much room does Pepper need to <laughs> say hello, an exciting hello when our CEO comes through, or you know, to bow and greet you know, certain distinguished guests from different countries. All those different mannerisms and ways that Pepper would act, we all just went through and we're all the team is pretty global so we've got people from from Europe from Asia from South America from Hawaii you know the team is pretty global so everyone had their different way that they would act it out um, and we would bring in random people from marketing or from finance or from engineering to come in and and we wouldn't tell them what we were experimenting or what we were trying to learn but we would have them walk in pretend to be pepper and act in a certain way and see how they responded to that so that role playing is just one way that we kind of like he said, um, bring people in and get that reaction and iterate and change based on how people respond to something we might think is super casual or you know way over the top, but they really enjoyed being greeted so um, exuberantly. Uh, the other thing that we do is we have an internal tool called uh, a Rex map, uh, and our UX lead Matt actually came up with it, and it has two different. Um, I would say sides to the coin. One is very straightforward. I think anyone in software does this. It's the human side of things. When a human you know, comes into an interaction or an experience, what are they thinking, what are they feeling, and what are they doing? These are the number one things that you're, you're worried about in terms of engagement, uh, in terms of retention. You, you know, what are they doing on my website? What are, they, what are they looking at? What kind of books are they reading when they you know, are going through the shelves? Uh, and then the other side of it is, you know, what's on Pepper's tablet? What lights are on on Pepper's body? What are Pepper's hands doing? What is Pepper saying? What is Pepper looking at? How is Pepper moving? So there are all of these different elements of Pepper that need to be, I would say, designed and considered even. Uh, even the motion and the movement, does Pepper turn towards you or does Pepper stay still? You know, you know, eyes straight, it's at work, it's focused. You know, all these types of things are considered for every single step in the interaction. And so once you do hundreds of these, they can be generalized and categorized into different contexts. And so now when Pepper speaks, you know, there's some automated 
gestures that can be performed because this is kind of similar to thinking and so we have Pepper you know, kind of mimicking things that we've seen uh, when we watch TV or, or watch cartoons and things like that but we do think about that at every single step, phase of it so trying to communicate as naturally as possible so that you can pick up on all of those subtle cues that you're already used to getting from other people. It's really interesting. And th this question is for everybody. It'll be a little tiny bit different for Brian. Um, so how do you think language and movement used in AI, robots, and the technology around us that we interact with every day might affect identity in students for you oh, okay. and then for everybody else, just, in, just for people in general? Yeah. Uh, so that is what I studied for the first 10 years of my career, <laughs> uh, essentially how we subtly communicate uh, um, mm -hmm. who we are through the way that we communicate, the words that we use. Uh, if a person is a stutterer, what are your initial conceptions or perceptions of who they are? If a person speaks with an accent, and I think there's, there's real power in that. And, and so I think a, a real forward kind of area for AI to be in is to really understand that research and how to integrate it into contemporary teaching and learning. So we're in an era where young people, if they don't know something, they don't go to a book. They don't ask their parents first. They Google it. They, they ask Alexa. So understanding how identity plays a role in that, right? affirmation. So what if there was an affirmation spoken to a young person as they ask a question? Psychology would say they would be better able to understand it in some ways. And so there's a wealth of ideas there. So I guess for me, identity cues that are easy, what language does the AI communicate in? What cultural cues, and so it's part of what I was talking about, whether it's auditory or gender selections of representations, if it is able to project those things. And so there's a, a future of subtle movements that I think can be incredibly impactful. Speaking of technology. Right. <laughs> I was done anyway. So oh, OK. <laughs> exactly. No, thank you. That's, that's super, super interesting. And um, for James, so I, if we just adopt the question a little bit just for people, mm -hmm. Um, how do you see language and movement being uh, affecting the way we see identity and in interacting with technology? Well, I actually what Brian said I kind of applies as well. It's like these people asking Alexa or asking, you know, trying to Google find these answers is already already showing that um, that we not only um, use it as a reference, but we almost trust these. These technologies more than people. Like, why would I ask this person? Oh, hey, what do you you know? You expect them to know more than the wealth of the internet? Mm, I don't know. So, I think in a way, sometimes some people and are, can develop a trust with uh, certain technologies and kind of rely on them. And and it's not too you know far fetched to think that, especially some of these uh, more sophisticated. Uh, you know, chat bots and things like that, where people are telling their closest secrets to a robot and trying to get advice on certain, you know, it could be anything, like relationship advice, financial advice. And they trust it, fully trust it as if it's like their friend. And I, yeah, that's, I think that's pretty fascinating. Thank you so much. And how about for, for now or Pepper? How, how does movement and language play into issues of identity? Yeah, so absolutely all of the motion has to be intentional mm -hmm. and contextual. Um, Pepper and Now are both, I would say in their personality, they're pretty spunky, like me, pretty peppy, <laughs> upbeat, very like willing to serve you. Um, but that's not always how they need to be. Sometimes when they're in an office, specifically like when Pepper's in someone's office, uh, they don't want to hear the same <laughs> humming and dawdling that Pepper would naturally do. Um, that's one thing we learned from you know talking to our customers. And so we had to actually innovate and have a, a less active, more toned down, you know, gentle version of, of Pepper's kind of idle state to accommodate the context that it was working in. Uh, that's, the, that's the number one thing I would say we, we debate over a lot is that Pepper is a professional. Pepper is a working robot out there, you know, trying to do its job, but it also has its own personality and character that the team uh, internally has developed. Uh, we actually are super fortunate to have a computational linguist on our team. Shout out to Allison. Um, and she helps us figure out what terminology we should be using, what dialogue is appropriate for work versus telling a joke versus, oh, there's a kid in front of me. I should probably speak in a way that's, you know, 
localized to the child or you know what country am I in all these things you know are considered and then uh, when you try and consider movement uh, typically pepper is still because it, it is it is still quite alarming to certain people to have something that looks like you and you know acts like you but isn't a human come towards you right so that motion of I'm coming after you makes people want to kind of take a step back. It's unfamiliar. You don't know what it can do. You don't know what it's capable of. And so our immediate instinctual reaction to the unknown is fear. Um, but Pepper will try and do things to encourage you to interact. So for example, if Pepper asks a question, it will, you know, hey, how was your day? Right? It'll lean in. It'll make eye contact. It'll try and do those things, um, as James mentioned, to garner that trust that is necessary for the communication to be effective. Yeah. And can you see an effect that um, AI technology like Pepper now have on how people communicate with each other, not necessarily with the robot, but with each other? Do you, do you see Ooh. Ooh. Pepper now affecting that at all? Um, I mean, I feel like this is just a, a typical social group dynamic, but when people are around Pepper, <laughs> in a group specifically, they have adopted a superiority complex. Ah, so, interesting. <laughs> in, a, in a lot of cases, it's either one way or the other. It's either this is a stupid robot and I'm way smarter than it. Let me try and break it or trick it or you know ask it something that is totally outside of the domain of what is relevant to this device, or just like you know, I would say like my grandparents with the iPhone. They're afraid of it. They don't want to break it. They don't want to touch it. It's this super advanced technology thing, and I should have nothing to do with it. Mm -hmm. um, and so typically in groups, I see individuals adopting either I'm above this technology mm -hmm. and I don't really you know, want to engage in it, or you know, oh, what can it, you know, what can it do? And so when we're designing Pepper's initial interactions, we try and be transparent about, I'm Pepper. These are the things I can do with you. I'm just here to help. Right, Pepper comes in a neutral stance. I don't know everything, but I'm learning. Right. Or, you know, hey, I really do know the answer to to this, and it will speak confidently about what it knows. So, yeah. So, do you think identity factors like gender, race, or culture play into into these perceptions that people have? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah I definitely think that there are just stereotypical ways that you know the two binary genders have been assumed yeah. to behave right men are supposed to be strong and fearless and women are just so hopelessly lost i mean i would say those responses i haven't seen them be related to gender mm -hmm. you know like there are certain women who are just like what is this thing and they'll go full force especially if they're with their girlfriends or if they're with their kids i've seen um, videos of, of moms approaching it and you know them being excited that their kids are being exposed to such a cool technology but um yeah i think pepper tries to be more transparent about its strengths and weaknesses than a normal person would and that that strikes a sense of empathy in people because like oh there you are you're just a robot trying to do your job yeah <laughs> you're just a cute little robot yeah <laughs> uh for so for james for uh, robopin how do you see this playing out do you see people changing the way they communicate with each other while a robopin is there uh from what i've observed i it's usually just like, oh, this is this is funny looking thing. This is cute. Uh, what can it do? What's and they start to, you know, try to look at it, talk to it, move, you know, see it move its arms around. So I definitely it does invoke uh, almost uh, almost every time like a kind of a positive response. Then at times, yes. Then there's some more people who are more technically minded. Hmm. Uh, what kind of uh, computer vision does this use? Oh, what what kind of software is running on this? Oh, does it blah 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 blah. You know, so they're more so. I've kind of seen a little bit of um, that type of reaction from like a purely technical standpoint and just kind of a more of a, wow, what is this, this thing? Yeah, the, it's, it's really interesting to think about the relationship between people and, and robots and AI and what kind of effect it might have on our relationships. Mm -hmm. So, Brian, speaking of that, uh, are there conceptual learning opportunities you see with using AI or robotics in the classroom. Uh, things like RoboPin, things like Pepper, Google Assistant, Alexa, Siri, these kind of uh, teach, teachable agents. What are the, on a conceptual level, what, what do you see the opportunities? All right, so, so again, going to my, my disciplinary focus on science, yeah. uh, there, there's so much potential in being able to diagnose what a person knows and being able to offer them sound instruction to get them where they need to be. I mean, I mean, they certainly, AI is, has, doesn't take a learning-based focus, but imagine your tutor being Alexa yeah. uh, or being RoboPen and being able to project 
based on what your answer is, here's what you need to know, short video. Okay. Then, and then knowing, if I want you to learn this, I'll ask you questions until you begin to show a pattern of, uh, of, of accuracy. So there's mm -hmm. the combination of kind of the data analytics and artificial intelligence mm -hmm. that can be embedded into these devices. And then what it can do for individualized learning, I think, is, is infinitely uh, powerful if the technology is trained to learn about learning. Mm -hmm. I think there's a, there's a great opportunity there. So I would argue that in, in subject matter like science, that is absolutely something that can happen, is being able to help people understand science better. So for example, uh, uh, Noah Feinstein is a professor at the University of Wisconsin. Madison, his work on healthcare, argues that people when they are diagnosed with the disease, a loved one is diagnosed with the disease, they become the most passionate learners about said disease. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see the artificial intelligence as really being a way to do that. And so if, if my mother is diagnosed with you know, whatever disease, is really getting that tutorial through the robot is, is certainly where we, we well, I, I see it heading in that direction. And can you see AI and robots being a vehicle for introducing discussion topics around human identity in the classroom? Things like gender, race, culture? I, my cynicism says no. <laughs> because uh, I think it was Jasmine who said, under, uh, uh, impactful engineers, understanding people and understanding the world. Right. So we were, we're asking the artificial intelligence to really understand the world, to have nuanced discussion about gender and racial politics. I would love to see that technology. Right? <laughs> the humans don't have it down yet. Right, so I know. I think it might be a little more challenging. <laughs> Jasmine, it's, what do you think? No, I mean, it's demonstrative. It's crazy. You see yourself. You see your assumptions reflected back at you. And because the robot doesn't have an ego or pride or can't be embarrassed, you know, it's literally reflecting what you've taught it. And for some people, it's shocking. You know, some people put, you know, clothes on Pepper and, you know, give Pepper its own name. And they, you know, have it adopt its completely different persona. And you can see it's so different, you know, from Europe to Asia to the U.S., how people respond to that thing that someone has characterized. Yeah. What are some of the differences that you see? <laughs> so definitely in Japan, um, Pepper's more in uh, masculine roles. Okay. Um, even if Pepper is a waiter or, you know, security or, or doing whatever it does in Asia, definitely more masculine, different voice there. The mannerisms are curt and concise and precise because that is what is expected of a man in that culture. Here we're pushing the boundaries of, you know, Pepper being more witty and fun and lighthearted and creative because we're entering the industry at a time where you're already talking to Alexa and Cortana and all these other feminine personalities. It would make sense for us to kind of follow that trend of, hey, Pepper's going to be, you know, with a higher pitch voice and maybe, right, you know, right. more submissive and more gentle because of what comes with that role. And so no one can pretend to be unaware in America of these traditional boundaries that have been placed on those genders. And while we don't want to comply with some of the negative connotations of it, we understand how, you know, behaving in these ways can, can evoke familiar responses from people. So yeah, you, you will see, you can see in the technology what we value in personalities and communications, what we respect and what is effective. Pepper could not run a boardroom meeting, I'll tell you that right now. But, but Pepper could definitely check everyone in, make everyone feel valued, appreciated, welcome, you know, excited to be there, you know, all those types of things that really bring everyone to that, that neutral position of equality. Thank you so much. How about for RoboPin, James? Uh, well, the short answer is yes, I believe it could have a you know impact on you know teaching uh, whether it be sort of a classroom setting or maybe more so on a, like a personal kind of one to one right. like tutoring type thing being able to kind of explain certain information or maybe project uh, you know a particular video or whatever so I, I believe yes like in the future that that something like that could be uh, it, I mean, of course that's what we hope <laughs> yeah and do you, along this lines of this topic do you think that we have an opportunity here to bridge some cultural divides? Uh, absolutely. Uh, I think so. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and how, how do you think that robotics could, robotics and AI can help us do that? Well, so it's kind of, kind of an, as an intermediary, uh, maybe if, if there's a group of people kind of standing around, they don't know each other, if it's in the middle of a room and it's a, kind of like people start gathering around it, they start talking. And what is this thing? They don't people. Maybe they don't know each other. 
you imagine that kind of a scenario, the robot's in the room, middle of a classroom, and all the students walk in there, and they see this thing, they don't know what it is, and it starts talking to them, and it might just spark some conversations, yeah. spark questions, that kind of thing. Yeah. Jasmine, I see you nodding. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. When, yeah, when I heard that question, my immediate thought is, I have this passion project around nonverbal communication. Yes, uh, yes, talk to us. Pepper has hands with fingers, but they're not all individually addressable. Like it can't move to do sign language, but I wish that it could um, because I've, I've just seen so many articles about bionics advancing and prosthetics advancing and, you know, Pepper can do certain, certain things, but um, in terms of bridging cultural gaps, um, the accessibility of translators to, to those who are deaf or mute is mm. scarce. Uh, and I'm not just talking about American Sign Language, but sign language in Flemish or Chinese or all these different, they have their own dialects and, and just local signs and things like that. And to be able to understand them and replicate those and make translation more available both ways, you know, Cause, because be Pepper amazing. can... Pepper would be able to, this is again my passion project dream, would be able to see the sign and say, oh, they said this, X, Y, and Z, in whatever language is possible because of natural language processing, amazing. And then be able to sign back to the person, right? So just filling that gap and having that understanding. And a lot is missing there, right? In terms of the expressivity, the intonation, all those things. But as Pepper learns and develops and gets more examples, it's literally bringing people together who in no other way could have been brought together. It's super exciting for the future. I love that idea, yeah. yeah. I yeah. hope you get to do it. I hope so, too. I hope so, too. But, you know, baby steps. <laughs> baby steps. So, Brian, how important do you think it is that we talk and think about how to reflect many different kinds of human identity in the identities of the AI and robots that we're designing and the personalities that we're designing? Uh, that's a tough question um, because it's, it's, it's assuming there is no identity embedded right. in the device or software and the fact is there is inherently if a human designed it an identity is present mm -hmm. and so the the challenge is what if we understand broadly the social sociological and psychological research around what how identities impact people then we we do know that it does have a profound impact so for example what i didn't show you in the study uh, i showed you a snapshot of our, our virtual reality uh, our study was to see if teaching students about the science in the context of their neighborhood changed their conception of how valuable science was to impacting and changing the community. Mm -hmm. And what we found was statistically significant shifts in their perceptions of how valuable science was to impacting and changing their community. So what, what, I, what I'm arguing here is that the subtle shifts in how people think about the world can be impacted by the way that they're, how they interact with uh, digital devices, and artificial intelligence and, and is even robots. And so I, well, if I'm selling a product today is I'm really challenging us to think more dynamically around how educational research, psychological research, and sociological research can create better technology and how that technology can influence people. Because the research says that people can be impacted by the examples they're provided, right. by the context that they're shown. And so I, I think that that uh, is the highest end of what technology can do is help people uh, be more advanced in our humanity. Absolutely. It, 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 infinitely important, it sounds like. James, I, as we think about designing robots, AI, personalities, how important do you guys think it is that we take these issues of human identity into account? Or do robots and AI have their own kind of identity outside of human identity? Uh, I think it's, uh, as Brian said, it's, it's humans who create these, these, um, these machines. And it, you basically, I think it comes down to also like the, right now, you know, creating these AIs, it requires these training data. And it's, uh, it's the, you know, the, the data itself, and whatever we tell it, to, whatever we train it on, however, what labels we put on these images or whatever, that's exactly what the robot's gonna, or the AI is going to interpret. Uh, we, so what we need is, you know, better quality um, data sets, data sets that have been maybe labeled by not just scientists and engineers or some people on Mechanical Turk that are doing it, but we need uh, social scientists, we need elderly people, we need young, we need to get like multiple different inputs on these, uh, on these, uh, these data sets that are 
being used to train these AIs, or else it may not quite have. It. Yes, they can do process X, Y, Z images in this amount of time, and yes, it can, uh, you know, beat this benchmark and uh, beat this, uh, you know, these types of neural networks or whatever. But I think, you know, the the the, the um, what we're going to have to do is to uh, just create high quality, uh, high quality data sets and high quality, um, you know, AIs that can, you know, take advantage of them. That's super interesting. And how about over at SoftBank <laughs> with Pepper and now? Yeah. Do you think that robots and AI have their own kind of identity? Or is it really important for us to think about how to reflect different kinds of human identity, like race and gender, yeah. culture, in the AI that's increasingly surrounding us? Yeah, I mean, I think the exposure to a diverse set of people and problems and populations is going to be critical to having um, Pepper be contextually relevant to someone, right? Like, if you, you can't serve the person well if you don't understand what they're going through. Yeah. You can't motivate someone if you don't know what they're passionate about or what excites them. So we'll definitely need to know that as we, you know, grow into different regions. But I, I like the other half of your question in terms of, like, <laughs> do robots have their own identity? Because I, I feel like there is no need to confine them to the boundaries that we've accepted as humans. Uh, when I, when I was you know, thinking about it, I was like, they're kind of like our children, right? Like, we want them to be the best versions of ourselves. We want them to be truthful and honest and efficient and always on time and always perfect. And, and you know, we read all these self-help books and do all these things to try and make ourselves better where we can just not put the flaws in, in there, right? Like, we see the things that we dislike about ourselves and we try and program in ways for them to avoid that or get around that or overcome that in a way that is sometimes impossible for us because we don't have access to it. Mm -hmm. But um, the one thing I, I did like about what James says was, was the massive data sets and the ability to, to adapt and be dynamic and continuously learn and continuously change. Because what, I mean, what I've noticed as like an up and coming millennial person is that I'm not like my parents and I'm not like my grandparents mm -hmm. because of the exposure that I've had to life that has changed my views about people and their values and what my expectations are of how people treat me because of who I am you know, versus what might have been accepted 30, 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. So I feel like with Pepper, Pepper is always learning. Pepper is always growing. Our team is constantly shifting and changing and moving and traveling and having these experiences or listening to customers who are just like, oh, I wish Pepper could do X, Y, and Z. And we're like, whoa, we never thought of that. <laughs> so, you know, having the ability to continuously change and not be, you know, set in its ways is going to be just critical to the success of the product globally. Thank you. So Brian, what kinds of opportunities can exposure to this kind of technology produce for students? Yeah, so th this is something I'm, I'm actually quite passionate about in that uh, I, I think exposure helps students see the possibility of being producers as opposed to consumers of this kind of technology. And then there's a kind of a catch-22 in contemporary education is that teaching computer science and robotics is it's, there's not fruitful for, let's say, for an elementary school because the assessment in fifth and eighth grade are in science alone. So a school who embeds engineering as a part of its curriculum is now running a, the risk of not performing well as an academic institution. Mm -hmm. And so uh, ideologically, what we're proposing, we're actually in, in, involved in some programs to take those after school hours between 3 o'clock and 6 o'clock mm -hmm. and make those spaces where students get practice in, in becoming producers of their own products, both physical and the software. And so I think ex exposure would certainly provide an opportunity for students to, to really see themselves as part of this community. That's so exciting. That sounds like an amazing program. Hopefully. Do you see these opportunities change across lines of gender or race or culture, the opportunities of exposure? Absolutely. Unless you're explicit about who belongs, mm -hmm. the world is, is driven by people's preconceptions. And as I use that, that word, uh, with intention is that we assume, and those things may be not explicitly communicated, as I mentioned earlier, uh, about my excitement for this Black Panther movie. I feel like I'm a producer, I'm selling it, right? <laughs> the idea that uh, the engineer is uh, a black female, and what that does is it literally changes our preconceptions about who can be a world class engineer. And so, if, if we don't explicitly say everyone should be an engineer, here, I'm going to hand you these materials. You're going to build an engineer, a robot, and you're going to program it. 
right? It's now it's difficult to tell and convince this child that they shouldn't be a part of it because they're doing it. Mm -hmm. But if we don't explicitly, explicitly communicate that this is the expectation we have of you, then they're guided by expectations that the world beyond has of who should become an engineer. And that, that is wrought with gender bias, uh, racial bias, and things of that nature. So how do you think we can address that? After school programs. After school for programs like yours. <laughs> we take everybody to go see Black Panther yes, and then we yes, build Yes, everybody right go see that. Black Panther on opening weekend. Absolutely. It's important. <laughs> opening weekend is important. Um, thank you so much. So, how about for people in general, uh, for RoboPin, what kinds of opportunities does access to technology like RoboPin have for just the general public outside of the student population? So I think just what's important, uh, it's important to know, and of course maybe many people already know, is that a lot of, not just RoboPin, I mean, yeah, RoboPin is, is our product and it's like a robotics platform we want to develop in the laboratory, blah, blah, blah. But a lot of the, uh, it's still just a robot, still a bunch of servos and a bunch of mechanical parts and you know LEDs and components. It's a dumb box with a lot of stuff in it. The smart stuff is the AI, the smart stuff is, you know, the engineering behind all these components and making it work together. And a lot of uh, these AI, um, these algorithms and these uh, frameworks like TensorFlow, they're all f publicly available, they're free. You can, anybody with a laptop has, can install TensorFlow. They can uh, run these, um, these uh, like image processing, uh, these things, and you do, these, do, do deep learning, do uh, machine learning, do all these sophisticated types of analytics you're with the with the laptop, you don't have to be a, a, a you know computer science major. You don't have to be an engineer. You can be anybody. You can be a, just someone who's curious about it or or whatever, and just you know take advantage of of these technologies and these um, systems that are you know essentially free and build on top of it, or at least just kind of tinker with it and play with it. And it's important to know that like hey, you you can you can you can do this too. You can just getting it out like hey, this is not just for some really you know, advanced engineering. Yes, it's, very, it's, pretty, it's very complicated. It's a very steep learning curve. I'm not going to attest to that. But you can watch YouTube videos that explain all this. Yes, it's yes. totally free. Yes. Even like it's a very uh, popular the, uh, CS231, uh, the computer vision course here at Stanford. I watched all the courses on YouTube. Free. That's, how yeah. that's Stanford education for free. You can't beat that. <laughs> No, you don't, may not may not get the credits for it, but you can see exactly what the students yeah. are learning. Mm -hmm. You can get the assignments they're learning. You can download the code for free, and anybody can do it who has a laptop, essentially. And if you don't have a laptop, if you don't have it, then maybe try to go to maybe uh, access, you know, beg your parents or something, or try to. You, and there's some publicly available resources, libraries, something like that. We can maybe try to, you know. Get get uh, public institutions like you know, libraries or something to set up these uh, technologies for people to use mm -hmm. or experiment with. I think would be important. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Make, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you for that. So, Jasmine, how about you? What What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, the audience member totally stole my thunder. Oh no. <laughs> uh, yes, I am a self declared maker. <laughs> I've been soldering Tell us what that means. Middle school. Yeah. Uh, I guess everyone has their own thing for it, but I like to make stuff with my hands. Maybe DIY or crafters. There's some craft people in the house. Yeah. <laughs> I just like to make stuff. And like, uh, like you mentioned, uh, education is incredibly accessible nowadays with the internet. And though libraries may not be like maybe going away, I mean it's there on your phones. On the even the simplest of phones have a web browser, and there's Wi-Fi in every Starbucks in America. Uh, it's tough. We're so we're so lucky here to have access to these things, and I would say the exposure to these things really one kind of sparks a sense of excitement and 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 magic, and the desire to want to participate in something that seems fantastic. I mean that's that's what happened to me, right? A movie. A movie that someone just, I don't know, spent a bunch of million dollars making changed the entire course of my life, right? Um, you know, I, if I had, I don't think I ever saw a robot until I was already in college, right? And so it was cartoons, anime, you know, movies, things like that that kept me excited about it. Um, when I was in school, we were just, um, I guess teachers were on this craze about teaching us how to type. 
You know, everyone was like doing like typing <laughs> yes. time and keyboarding yes. class, and like you got to know how to use Microsoft Office, and everybody had it on their resume. Oh yes, proficient in Excel and PowerPoint. <laughs> and nowadays, it's like totally taken for granted. If you right. can take, if you can like put Microsoft Office on one of your skills, like you're wasting space on your resume. But you know, it's it's now transitioned from okay, now you know how to use a computer to now you can actually, um, as Brian was saying, produce with this computer. Learning how to code, learning how to you know think logically and algorithmically and solve all these technical problems is the next phase. But as you mentioned, if you don't have access to a laptop, if your school doesn't care about computer science, you're immediately behind the curve. Because I think we've all accepted that technology is going to you know, permeate every single industry. There's nowhere you can go. And you can no longer accept that these things are just not for me, or these things are out of bound, or they're out of reach. And, and I'm, I'm super excited that there are maker spaces popping up where, you know, you don't have to own a soldering iron. You can literally just show up, and people like me will be there like, you want to learn how to solder? It's amazing. <laughs> or like, hey, let me teach you about wearables by sewing LEDs into your favorite t-shirt and showing you how you can light up your own life. Like, these things, and, and, and people just being passionate about sharing what they know, about pulling other people's up, uh, so we don't have the, the gaps that we have today, right? You know, that you feel like you have to be a scientist. Like, I'm, I'm trying to compete at eight years old with Isaac Newton, right? Yeah. I'm definitely not there, right? I'm not a genius by any means, but, you know, I kind of clawed my way up there, and, you know, it's just been, it's been great to be exposed to all these different technologies. It's, it's crucial if they're going to they're gonna make impact in the future. They've got to know what the possibilities are and that they aren't out of reach.